to uh, Acts chapter 9. I've already told you what this is about, the transformation of uh, Saul the Pharisee into um, Paul the Apostle. Again, let me remind you too that that change in name was, was really not meant to be anything significant. It was simply his Hebrew name, Saul, his, his, his Roman name, uh, Greek name, Paul, Paulus. Um, Saul was perhaps a grandiose name in some regards because it was the name of a former king, and Paul meant little, basically humble. It's kind of like junior okay, in, our, in our terms today. So, you know, we were talking about Paul, you were talking about junior. Not, not a, a grandiose name, not meant to be one that, uh, of an exalted person, but rather one who humbled himself to become a servant of the Lord. Well, we see that beginning uh, now. Um, as uh, the Lord changes His direction. Um, actually, last week we ended in verse 19. We're going to begin in verse 19 because here's one of the few places where the person who actually made the verse divisions did a bad job. So there is a new subject uh, breaking in here. We're going to start in the second half of verse 19. Now, for several days he, Saul, was with the disciples who were at Damascus and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. All those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, Is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? But, but Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ when many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were also watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. When he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. And he was with them moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to put him to death. But when the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up, and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. All right, so let's take a look at this text, but let's again be reminded of what we saw last week as well. Last week, we saw Saul the Pharisee on his way to Damascus to stamp out Christianity, to stamp out the Christian heresy that had already spread that far north, watching Stephen being stoned to death and guarding, as it were, the coats of those who were doing the stoning wasn't enough to satisfy Saul's hatred for the church. Everyone who followed this cult had to repent or be executed. Remember, a cult is like a spinoff from a, an existing religion. Uh, they considered this to be a cult of Judaism. Now, Saul was not unique. His hatred was not unique. The Bible tells us, the Lord tells us in His Word, that this is actually what we were like before the Lord had mercy on us. And if we didn't appear to be quite as vehemently against the church as Saul was, it's only because the Spirit of God was restraining the sin in our hearts more than he was restraining the sin in Saul's heart. Given the right circumstances, we would have done the same thing. You know, that saying that goes, but for the grace of God, there go I. It's true. It's only God's grace that makes us to differ. Common grace when we were unbelievers and, of course, saving grace now that we are believers. It's not us, okay? It's the Lord who makes the difference. So still intent on killing everyone who called on the name of the Lord... He went to the high priest for the necessary authority to imprison anyone he found in Damascus belonging to the way, that he might bring them back to Jerusalem for trial, and armed with this authority, he set out. Now, remember, Jesus, of course, had other plans. He had something else in mind for this uh, juggernaut, as it were, that was heading towards Damascus. 
Uh, Solomon reminds us in Proverbs 16, verse 9, the mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Okay, so Saul had a plan, but the Lord had another plan, and the Lord obviously ultimately trumps our plans. So as Saul approached the city, Jesus appears to him in, in his glory, all his glory in this brilliant blaze of light, and it forces Saul to the ground. And he asks Saul this question, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why do you hate me, Saul? Now, that's a good question, isn't it? Because how can anyone hate Jesus? I mean, many people do, but why do they hate Jesus? Jesus is absolutely perfect in every way. Jesus is infinitely gracious. He doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us mercy. He is the very definition of love. You know, His life was just one example of continual love. He, gave, he came into the world, remember, to give up His life, to lay it down, so that everyone who believes in Him might be spared an eternity of suffering in a fiery hell, in a very real place of suffering. But again, that's how irrational, how evil sin actually is. It causes us to view the most beautiful as ugly. The one who should be loved the most is one who is to be hated. That's what sin does. And by the way, that's why we should hate sin. Now, Saul wasn't quite sure who was asking this question, remember, as far as he was concerned. He hadn't attacked anybody in particular. But those Jews who believed that Jesus was alive. And so he asked this one speaking to him, who are you? Lord, and we don't want to read too much into the word Lord. You know, it's not that he necessarily knew that God was speaking to him or the Son of God was speaking to him. The word Lord can mean sir, and it's used in that context. He knew this person, whoever he was, had power, and that power should be respected. And so he asked the question, and Jesus answered, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting to attack my church, Jesus says, is to attack me. And the same thing is true with regard to us. You know, we are in union with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are one with Him. And when somebody attacks us, somebody offends or injures us because we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, He takes that personally and He does something about it. Now that His identity and His Lordship were established, He ordered Saul to go into the city and there he would be told what it is he must do. The Lord has the right to command him. The Lord has the right to command us. He made us. He saved us. We belong to him. And that is why we should listen to him. Because he has done all these things. And because he has this authority. When Saul got up, he realized he was blind. And so he had to rely on others to bring him into the city. Remember, he remained in that condition for three days during which he fasted and sought the Lord. And again, that's what we're supposed to do when we come under this kind of conviction. When we need the Lord's mercies, we need to seek for those things through fasting. And fasting is one of the most effective ways that God has given to us to ask for a particular mercy. Which is why, again, being those who are in need of many mercies... We should fast, and we should fast often. At the end of these three days, the Lord sent Ananias to lay his hands on Saul, to pray for him that he would regain his sight. And when he did, scales fell from Saul's eyes. Now he could see again, but not just through physical eyes. Now he could see through new eyes, spiritual eyes. Now he had a new respect, a new love, a new affection for the one whom before he had hated. And so he got up and was baptized, you know, receiving that sign of the covenant that Jesus had made with his people, identifying himself as being one of his. After eating, he regained his strength and he immediately set out to serve his Lord. Okay? There was an immediate change in his life. Now, surprisingly, there are many who profess to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ today who somehow believe that the new birth, you know, basically being raised from death to life, has little or no effect on us or on the way that we live. I 
I probably told you this once before, but uh, in a conversation with a former college professor of mine, uh, he once said, more than once um, in class, but in, in, you know, basically in a personal conversation, that when a person comes to Jesus, we shouldn't expect to see much of a change at all. The person is still substantially the same as they were. He believed that to insist that a true believer must obey and follow Jesus if they truly are born again is essentially to um, destroy God's grace by adding works to salvation. Now, it's also likely, I believe, that he had seen so many profess to know the Lord Jesus Christ whose lives showed little or no change uh, when, they really, or when they said they believed that he had to come up with some kind of a reason why they don't change. And the reason is, well, you really, the Bible doesn't say you really have to change, okay? So, again, that reminds me of what a professor in seminary once said, where you have what the Bible teaches and what we actually do. He says, if what we do doesn't line up with what the Bible teaches, then one or two things are going to happen. Either we're going to change the way you know, we live so that we conform with what the Bible says, or we're going to change what the Bible says so it conforms to the way that we want to live. And more often than not, that is actually what takes place. Now, he, did, he, he didn't understand what the Bible clearly teaches in his word. He did understand this, that it's true that nobody can add anything to the work that Jesus did for our justification. Our justification, our salvation is based on Jesus' work alone. But it's also true, and the part he didn't understand, is that everybody who is born again, who has trusted Jesus, who is justified by His righteousness, by grace alone, through faith alone, will do good works. The Bible says we'll even be zealous for good works, which means very active because they have a great affection and love for the Lord. Now, I think this morning Luke gives to us one of the clearest examples of this in the transformation that took place in Saul's life. A transformation, remember, that isn't unique to him, but something the Lord says will be true of everyone who believes in him. Again, not necessarily directing that zeal in the same direction or even having that same amount of zeal, but having zeal, right? Still having zeal for the Lord. We are going to differ according to our makeup, our character, our gifts, abilities, physical as well as spiritual, how much time we spend with the Lord, how often and how intensely we serve Him. But there will be that change, and it will be a dramatic change. So what I want us to consider this morning from our text are basically three things. Three things that happened because of the Lord's work in Saul's life. First of all, the obvious change in him, right? The one who hated the church and tried to destroy it now gives himself to build it up. Second thing is the transformation that took place in those around Saul according as to whether they loved the Lord or not. Those who didn't love the Lord began to hate him. And then thirdly, the church, the change that took place in the church. Instead of being under attack, now that this champion has been transformed to a champion for Christianity, the church now enjoys peace. So first of all, we see the transformation in Saul himself. The one who hated the church and tried to destroy it now gave himself unreservedly to build it up. Now, the first thing Saul did was he spent time with the disciples who were in Damascus. He spent time with the family of God. When God adopts us into his family, which he does through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we begin to see the family of God as our own family. And since we now share the Lord's nature, His moral nature, remember the divine nature that we saw in 2 Peter chapter 1, which is the Holy Spirit and the love for holiness, we are now drawn to those who also share that same character, that same love. Now, this tells us that we should be concerned. If we enjoy spending more time with unbelievers, or we enjoy that more, then we spend time, you know, enjoy spending time with believers because those who have this new nature desire to spend time with God's people, with His family. And that's what, what Paul did, or Saul. I, I want to call him Saul until the text begins to call him Paul. Now, in this fellowship, 
which we, we can only imagine what it was like, right, to, to have been under those particular conditions when the church is persecuted. We often think it's in shambles, but it's when the church is persecuted that it actually thrives. So here we have this new church, basically newly formed, filled with the Holy Spirit, and under persecution. I would imagine this church was, its fellowship was very rich, its fellowship was very meaningful, it was you know, a group of people who were seeking the Lord. I think it was very encouraging for Saul to be a part of this, and I think it gave him a spiritual boost. And by the way, that's another reason why we are to meet together, is to enjoy this kind of fellowship, which will give each of us a spiritual boost in serving the Lord. That's what we ought to strive to do, not expecting others necessarily to come to us for that reason, although we hope they might, but to be that kind of encouragement also for them. But with this encouragement, Saul immediately begins proclaiming Jesus as the Son of God. Now, this is extraordinary. Notice where he went to do this. He didn't go to the least public place and in a corner, in a dark room somewhere, shared Jesus timidly with maybe one or two people. But he went to the very center of Jewish worship in Damascus. That would be the synagogue. And I'm sure there was more than one. He went to the synagogues on the Sabbath where the Jews had gathered together for worship. And he proclaimed Christ to them. <laughs> I mean, this is the same Saul, okay, who just a few days earlier, you know, was on his way to Damascus to destroy the church. And, of course, everybody in the synagogue knew that, you know, who, uh, I mean, formerly was going to the synagogues looking for Christians to get them to renounce Christ and to drag them off to prison. And now he was arguing for the very thing he was trying to destroy. I mean, that, what do we call that? It's a 180. That's light and darkness, isn't it? Paul turned completely from the direction he was going and went completely the opposite direction and that's what repentance is. We're going the wrong way, and we turn around and we start going the right way. It isn't just a change of mind about who Jesus is. Those who believe that our lives will not be changed by the gospel, they think repentance is a change of mind about who Jesus is. I thought he was a lunatic or a liar, but now I see that he's Lord, and that makes me a Christian. Well, no, that doesn't make you a Christian. You're only a Christian if you trust in this one who is Lord and you begin to follow him, something like, like this. So again, they are amazed at, at what's going on in his life. I think we have to admit, as we look at Saul, I mean, doesn't that encourage you? The power of a changed life, this really happens, is, is a tremendous testimony to the truth of the Christian faith. And that is a good reason why, of course, when we are transformed by that same grace, that we can also potentially do a lot of good, especially in the lives of those who knew us before. I mean, certainly this had a tremendous impact. This transformation that took place in Saul had the same kind of effect on the Jews that the miracles Jesus did had on them. It made them stop. They were amazed, right? It's the same, same word that's used. It stops traffic. And it shows that God was at work in his life. But, you know, they didn't take that sitting down. They tried to argue against him, but no matter how much they argued against him, Paul just grew stronger and continued to confound them, proving that Jesus is the Christ. I mean, he had definitely had the winning argument. They didn't want to believe it because, you know, their hearts were steeled against him. It wasn't because he didn't have a good argument. He proved it, and they still resisted. Now, again, what's my point here? My point is when the Lord comes into our lives, the changes that He produces are not subtle changes. We are no longer what we were before. I mean, what were we before Jesus? Dead. Okay, we were dead. We were corpses, spiritual corpses. That's how much spirituality we had within us. We were not good people, remember. We were enemies of God, haters of God. We didn't do anything good in God's eyes although we were not as bad as we could have been. We had no love in our hearts for Him. We only really resisted Him. But God made us alive. And if we were dead before and we're alive now, we should expect there to be some changes, right? We should be moving now in the direction we would not have gone before because now we have desires for those things. 
We are now new creatures in the Lord Jesus Christ. New creatures will live differently. And the main differences are these. Before, we were going the direction of the world. Now we're going to go the direction Jesus tells us to go. Before, we hated God, but now we love Him. And that's the reason why we want to go that direction. And, of course, we'll go that direction to the degree that we love Him. So, there, you know, is there no discernible difference between a believer and an unbeliever, between somebody who's dead and somebody who's alive? I mean, can you tell the difference physically when somebody's dead and somebody's alive? Well, the Bible tells us we can see the difference also spiritually between those two things. The one who is alive practices righteousness. They do what Jesus tells them to do. The one who is dead practices sin, does the things that Jesus tells us not to do or doesn't do the things He tells us to do. Well, there was a radical transformation. I think we all agree in Saul's life. Now, secondly, because these changes are not subtle, because the people of the world can see them, it draws out their hatred. We see that in Saul's life, don't we? Now, Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, verses 10 through 12, the verses I wanted us to see this morning. He says, now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, notice he's, he's basically saying to Timothy, you not only you know, uh, did what I told you to do, but you also suffered for it. And he says, that will happen to everyone who desires to live godly in Christ Jesus. And again, who is it that desires to live godly in Christ Jesus? Christians, okay? Those who are born again of the Holy Spirit. So, we will live this life and we will suffer for it. Now, the Jews saw Saul now as their enemy and they wanted to kill him. That's quite a change of attitude, I'd say. And it's not simply because he had deserted to Christianity that that was part of it but because he had become such a powerful supporter of Christianity. They began watching the gates of the city day and night, hoping to catch him because they wanted to kill him. They even enlisted the governor of the city against him. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 32, in Damascus, which is where he is now, the ethnarch under Eretus the king, basically the governor of the city, was guarding the city of the Damascenes in order to seize me, okay? Saul was beginning to experience what Jesus said would be true of him, what he said to Ananias. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake, which was not a punishment, remember, for Saul's persecuting the church, but rather this is the consequence of living a godly life. People aren't going to like you. But he also at the same time began to see that what Jesus said to his disciples in the Great Commission was also true I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And remember how he just told Timothy how he delivered him from these persecutions. Out of them all, the Lord rescued me. Well, the Lord spared him by, again, using this particular means. Saul discovered what they were intending to do to him. Either one of his supporters overheard them and warned him, or the Lord simply revealed it to him. And he escaped by being lowered over the wall in a large basket with the help of the disciples. So he escapes. Now again, being a Christian, doing what our Lord commands us to do, is not going to win friends and influence people. It's not going to make us popular with the world. If we are Christians and we are popular with the world, then we're not doing something right. Because Jesus said, darkness hates the light. Who's more perfect than Jesus? I mean, he did everything absolutely right, and yet who was more hated than Jesus was hated by his own people? If we live and speak like him, we're also going to be treated like him. Not by everybody, obviously, but we should, I think, experience some kind of persecution if we are going to live like Jesus, particularly in this world in which we live. It's getting a little bit dangerous, you know, to speak the truth against certain politically correct ideas. 
But yet, if we're called upon the Lord to do that, I mean, we don't necessarily want to go out and wave a flag that I'm against this or that. But if it comes up in our conversations with someone, we're not to hide the light under a bushel. We need to shine that light, okay? But if we do, and we are persecuted, Jesus, remember, tells us, rejoice, rejoice. They treated the prophets in the same way. Our reward in heaven is great. And Saul's reward would be great because of the persecution he suffered. Now, when Saul came to Jerusalem, we, we see this start up again. I mean, at first, it started with, with the disciples, okay? When he came to Jerusalem, not surprisingly, he found that this, the disciples to be a little bit standoffish. They were afraid of him, okay? They didn't believe that he had changed. Now, what do you think about those disciples? Yeah, I mean, that, isn't that shameful? Well, I, I think that if we had been there, we probably would have thought the same way. Hey, guess what? World War II, Hitler's repented. He wants us to join him for lunch. Are we going to go and join him for lunch? I think we're going to feel a lot like these guys. I mean, Hitler, the guy who wants to massacre whole races of people and take over the world, he's changed. Well, they were thinking the same thing about Saul. Maybe Saul here is going for the long con. Have you heard that expression before where you go through these elaborate means and you get people to trust you so you can really get them in the end? Maybe he's just promote, trying, you know, pretending to promote Christianity and looking like he was being persecuted so that he could ultimately infiltrate the leadership in Jerusalem and basically kill the apostles. Now, we do need to be careful whom, you know, we receive into Christian fellowship, whom we receive into the church, but we need to remember not to be overly suspicious of people. We don't want to keep any true believers outside of the fellowship, and I think perhaps it's best to err on the side of charity, and that's exactly what Barnabas did. Remember Barnabas. Barnabas is like Greatheart, isn't he, in, in the... Um, Pilgrim's Progress, part two, the one who embraces people and trusts that, you know, that they are the Lord's rather than suspecting that they're not. Barnabas, whose name means son of consolation, son of comfort, son of encouragement. That's the name the apostles gave him because that's what they saw in him. Hey, this guy's a real encourager. You know, let's call him Barnabas. Barnabas was willing to give Saul the benefit of the doubt. So he listened to his testimony, how he had seen the Lord how the Lord had talked with him. And then he perhaps heard from other Christians what Saul had actually done in Damascus, how he boldly proclaimed the Lord in the synagogues to the point where the Damascenes wanted to kill him, the Jews that lived there. And so he believed him, and he brought him to the apostles. He explained these things to them, and they received him. And they finally embraced him. Now he was a part of their number. Now he was able to move freely throughout Jerusalem, speaking out boldly for the Lord. And it wasn't long before those in Jerusalem wanted to kill him. He went back to his old acquaintances, the Hellenistic Jews. Remember, Paul was a Hellenistic Jew. Remember that Paul was likely with these Hellenistic Jews when they were arguing against Stephen, okay? And he began to reason with them now from Stephen's perspective instead of his former perspective. And it wasn't long before they also wanted to kill him in the same way that they had killed Stephen. So the brethren took him down to Caesarea, which is basically a port city on the coast, and sent him back to his hometown of Tarsus, where they thought he might be safer in the meantime and also perhaps more useful there among his friends. Now, do you see a pattern emerging here, you know? Paul's pattern was he proclaimed Christ. The world's pattern was basically they hate people that proclaim Christ. And so Saul was hated because he was doing this. Jesus said to his disciples, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world. Because of this, the world hates you. If we live like Jesus, the people of this world will also hate us. I mean, they may not be quite as open about it as they were in, in the days of Paul. And the Jews, you know, were quite expressive people. You know, they, they tend to 
kind of go on both sides of the emotional spectrum rather quickly. So you can expect some kind of an explosive response. And maybe there are some people like that in our culture, but most people are a little bit more subdued than that. But they will hate you, Jesus says. But the point is, Jesus has called us to be like Him. He has called us to live like Him, which means He is calling us to be hated by the world. But we need to remember that when that happens, He will also be with us and He will protect us. So we don't need to worry about it. Now, finally, now that Paul, who was, as, or excuse me, Saul, who was the, the, again, the main instigator of this persecution had been converted, basically, who was putting all this pressure on the church, uh, now that he was basically converted, we see the church then get a bit of a respite, okay? There's, there's, there's peace. We read in verse 31, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. So this peace brings about an increase, which I think is interesting. The Lord blessed them with this calm after the storm. Jesus tells us that we are to expect persecution and trouble, but not all the time. Remember um, John Bunyan in Pilgrim's Progress as he is moving Christian further down the road on the way to the celestial city. He meets with a lot of difficulty along the way, doesn't he? But there are also those respites, those places of rest, those oases, as it were, spiritual places of refreshment. And I think that's what we see here and why Bunyan included it in, in his book. Now, this doesn't mean that the work stopped. There were still many Jews throughout the Roman Empire that needed to be reached, still many Gentiles. But it did mean the church had time to regroup, had time to refresh. And they used the time for that purpose. You know, oftentimes when, when the pressure lets up, the tendency for the church is basically just to kind of relax, you know, take it easy, get a lounge chair, get some lemonade and lay out in the sun, so to speak. But that's not what they did. They, they remained industrious, seeking the Lord. They used this time, first of all, to build themselves up, to strengthen their faith through basically by study of the Scriptures, personal devotion seeking the Lord in prayer. They nurtured the fear of the Lord in their souls. They also grew in this. They grew in their respect for the Lord. Basically, their desire to honor Him. They were growing into the image of His Son, and they wanted to honor the Lord and to be a good witness to Him, uh, for Him to others. And then Luke says they continued in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. So as they pursued what the Lord had for them, they experienced uh, the blessing of the Holy Spirit, the peace and the joy that comes with being filled with the Spirit. You know, the Bible says when you're filled with the Spirit, you don't babble, okay, and you don't make grandiose claims, and you don't spew out heresy, which is how it's usually associated today in churches. But when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you experience love, joy, peace, and the fruits of the Holy Spirit. You love the Lord more, you serve the Lord more, you love His people more, you want to spend more time with His people. So the result of all of this, basically Luke tells us, is that the church continued to increase. Now, that is the bottom line, isn't it? You know, what is it that the Lord is after in everything that He's doing? This is what He's after, the increase of His church, the growth of His kingdom, the gathering in of His lost sheep. Uh, the only way this is going to happen is when His church does the things that they do. All these things that we do here, all the things we do at home in our personal devotion, our study of the Word of God, uh, learning what He wants us to do is so that we can be the means of advancing His kingdom in this world. And it only happens, you see, if we actually do these things that the church was, was doing, nurturing our souls in His Word, seeking Him in prayer meeting together with His people so that we might be blessed by one another's gifts, seeking to be filled with the Holy Spirit, growing into the likeness of His Son. You see, those things have to take place before the kingdom is going to advance. If the kingdom isn't advancing, it's likely because that's not happening in the Christian community. So we do need to devote ourselves to these things, even as they did. 
if we are going to be useful to the Lord, if He's going to use us. And again, there is nothing that we can do in heaven or earth, anywhere in the universe, that would be more fulfilling and more of a blessing than actually being used by the Lord. He's not telling us to serve Him for nothing, go through this hardship, just live a miserable life. That's not what He's saying. But what He's saying is, I'm going to bless you as you do these things. You will be so fulfilled. Paul rejoiced in that catalog of things that happened to his body, remember? The times he was beaten and stoned and whipped and beaten with rods and so forth. He counted all those scars and considered it a blessing to have been used by the Lord that way because he was in a state, a spiritual state of blessedness that very few people really understand. And it's because he was willing to do that for the Lord. So again, serving the Lord is not going to make you popular. Doing what He calls us to do, coming out as it were and speaking the truth, it's, it's, you know, it's not going to make people like you. Uh, it's not going to be a glorious life. It's not going to be a, you know, necessarily a pleasant life, but it's going to be a blessed life and it's going to be worth it more than anything else that you could possibly do, even if He had become the king of the Pharisees, you know, the greatest among the teachers of Israel. That wouldn't hold a candle to His blessedness of having served the Lord in this way. And that's, that was true of Jesus too, wasn't it? His life was not easy. He is glorified because He humbled Himself to become the servant that He did. And because of that, you see, He's exalted as the name above every name. That's the path we have to take to the blessing that the Lord holds out to us. We just simply need to believe that that is a blessed path. And we need to be willing to suffer in order to walk in that path. Well, let's, uh, let's take a moment, let's bow in, in prayer, let's ask the Lord to help us to understand, test this by the Word of God, and then how we might apply this, ask Him for the grace to, uh, to be able to do that. He's not saying, again, go out and put a, a bullseye on your shirt with the most offensive thing you can think of and, you know, wave around a flag and try to get people to hate you, but what He is saying is, you know, stand out for Christ, you know, stand up for Him, stand up for His truth, speak out. Tell people about Jesus, and when necessary, tell them what sin actually is uh, when it becomes those particularly sensitive issues as well. Well, let's, let's pray. Let's spend some time in silent prayer.